My name is Mark Baratelli, and I created the Food Truck Bazaar. Uh, it's the city's and the Central Florida's original gourmet food truck gathering. It's now in six cities. It averages about 1,000 attendees. And the next one is this Sunday. It's on your coupons behind Fashion Square Mall from 5 to 8 p.m. I'd like you to meet the panel. They're going to introduce themselves and say which food truck they're from. Okay. My name is Alex Marin, and I'm one of the co-owners of the Yum Yum Cupcake Truck. Yay. I'm Joey Conicella. I'm the other co-owner of the Yum Yum Cupcake Truck. Uh, I'm Tony Adams. I am the chef and owner of the Big Wheel Mobile Food Truck. I am Alex Flores. I'm the owner of the Twisted Cuban Food Truck. I am Sylvia Ramby, and I am the owner and chef of Traveling Gourmet. My name is Bryce Balf. I'm the chef and owner of Fork in the Road. My name is Kimberly Abrams Parson, and I'm the owner of Mama's Fixin' Soul Food and Barbecue. My name is Jeff Carutis. I'm the owner of K Burgers. Uh, I'm the owner and uh, part owner of the K Burgers. So um, I thought we would talk first about uh, the owners and their businesses and the Orlando food truck scene and then get into uh, the basics of how to start a food truck. So uh, first question, why did you start a food truck? And uh, anyone can start the answer or anyone can start answering. Well, we launched Yum Yum Cupcake Truck purely as a um, way to better our lifestyle and spend more time together so that at the very yeah, now we spend a lot of time together and apart. But <laughs> it's always working, but it's ours, so um, that was the basis. It began as a, as a dream, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have that dream. Um, it was not out of, you know, to the desire to make a ton of money, because we made much more money in our old jobs, you know, had a lot more free time in our old jobs, but it, there was a dream and there was an ambition there, and that would, that's what drove us to do what we did. Yeah, I think for me, starting, a, I, I'm one of the, and, and, and coming from the position of I'm one of the few food truck owners that had a business before and expanded my business into a food truck. Um, I had big wheel provisions for about uh, two years doing farmers markets and catering and we had a pretty good name for ourselves and for us we had a pretty strong brand in still the boutique area and, um, and, and uh, again I'm sure like many of you out there either ha uh, were, were working in restaurants or something like that and saw it as a way to expand my brand um, but but I didn't have a couple hundred thousand dollars to open a restaurant, a brick and mortar. Um, and so we, we looked at, for us, a way to expand and financially it made the most amount of sense in a mobile unit like this because it was significantly less, at least in the upfront costs, uh, 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 you know, to get, to get open. So for us it was about expanding our brand and being able to put a better, more consistent product out than what we were able to do two days a week at a farmer's market. So. Uh, for us, we actually uh, own Half Full Coffee House out in Deland, Florida, and we wanted to do, we were thinking about doing a secondary venture, actually doing a truck with that same concept, and at the end of uh, one of the trips to, to Miami for me, uh, that's where I'm from, born, born and raised, and uh, saw what was going on down, down there and decided to go to my Cuban roots. And for me, it was a way to express myself my, my cultural background as opposed to just do the coffee, which is what, what, was, what we were working on for such a long time, for three and a half years. After three and a half years, we actually uh, closed down our coffee house and the trucks are doing fantastic. Uh, for me, it was uh, financial. Sorry, can you just remind everyone which truck you're with? Oh, so I am with uh, the, twi the Twisted Cuban. That's me, and I own the That truck. was Twisted Cuban. <laughs> <laughs> with a C, not a Q. <laughs> and I'm still here with Traveling Gourmet, and mine was also a financial reason. Um, I don't think I would have gotten approved for a $200,000 loan to begin with, so I had to go in a different direction, and the food truck, it was affordable, and I didn't have to mortgage my house or anything to do it. Uh, Bryce with Fork in the Road. I, similar to Sylvia, after spending a lot of time in restaurants and building restaurants and running them, um, I wanted to do something myself and the, the smallest amount of money that I had to put in was a mobile kitchen. So that's what we decided to, to build and, and run. Likewise, uh, mine started a little bit more grassroots with people eating around my kitchen table almost every weekend. And I was <laughs> pretty much encouraged by family and friends. And I started to think about it and they encouraged me to start doing lunches and I started a delivery service 
two offices downtown and in the Maitland areas. And out of that, people started saying, well, why don't you open a restaurant? And of course, due to finances, I did not want to put that kind of investment out and have the overhead that's required to maintain a brick and mortar type establishment. So the food truck was uh, reasonable and uh, we decided that we could do it in a way that we could take the business to the people as opposed to relying on the people to always come to us. Uh, Kay Burrs, um, our concept was basically started from a family recipe um, <clears throat> that's been cooked about 50 years. Uh, my father decided uh, that he came to me one day and said, why don't you take and put this concept into play? Uh, I've been chefing for about 20 years as a professional chef uh, for a lot of companies, and I wanted a different lifestyle instead of working from 5 a.m. till 12 o'clock at night time, what I've been doing for a long time. I decided to do this so I could take my breaks when I wanted to take my breaks, pick my work when I wanted to pick my work. We also have a catering company that's been in Orlando for the last 10 years, too, and we've been catering very quietly. Uh, I left the professional business in 2001 and enjoyed my life ever since then. My wife decided to come to work for us uh, last May, and we decided to start this concept. Uh, it's been a fun road. It's been a very interesting road, and we very much enjoy it. So um, <clears throat> we're going to get into how to start a food truck, but uh, I'm going to assume that most of you are going to start your food truck in Orlando. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the like gourmet Orlando food truck scene is about a year old. Would everyone <coughs> a year-ish old? A year. Yep. Um, so I know this is a loaded question, and you can take any aspect of it. What is the, if you can let them know, what is the Orlando gourmet food truck scene like? <laughs> yes, I think it's I think it's really tough. I think that um, uh, and, and speaking for Big Wheel, we we oftentimes get credited for being one of the first. I think that Yum Yum and and Steve from the Crooked Spoon launched uh, very similar to times us as well as Korean Barbecue, um, for better or worse or whatever. I, we often get credited as being one of the first, and mm -hmm. and um, it, it's been the hardest thing we've ever done. It's been a lot of digging and fighting and scratching the last year to um, figure out the laws and figure out the dynamics of the customers and. Um, I lost my shirt the first three months being downtown two blocks from here, and, and so that was crazy. And, but, but I think in the last year, we've been able to determine the way that Central Florida reacts to that. Um, and, and what we've learned is, is that there's plenty of room in Orlando um, for people who are executing really great things in their chosen area. I mean, Twisted yep. Cuban, these guys are always rocking it. Cup, cup, cupcake truck, these guys, every time I see them, they get a line, you know, uh, that I'm envious of. Um, and, and we don't do too bad ourselves, you know, for what it is, and, and these guys as well. So we all fit into our niche, and we all are starting to become even more well-known for our each individual thing. But but that wasn't the case, you know, when we all launched. And even still, there's, there's a lot of stuff that we find out as a new truck comes out each week or each month, or, you know, there's still a lot of discussion that happens internally in back channels between all of us about, oh, you know, your dish is really similar to mine, or how was this event, or what was that event, and, and so there's been a lot of that. The food truck scene is definitely growing. Um, you know, a year ago, people I don't even think would have <laughs> thought to, they could get that type of uh, quality product out of a mobile kitchen. Um, and it's been, uh, for the last year, it's been a bunch of, you know, you kind of feel things out. Each event is different. Some things are fundraisers, some things are catering, some things are food truck bazaars, you know, and we all kind of, you know, Tony tried sitting in one parking lot and thought, you know, just like a restaurant, consistency of hours and location, people will get to know you and come and, you know, <clears throat> he, he decided that didn't work for him, um, but there's still a lot of great things going, a lot of great growth, uh, growth going, and there's tons of opportunity in the Orlando food truck scene and market? I think the scene also, it's, it's, it's about the trucks, but it's also about the people in Orlando, uh, the customers. And you know, the city gets a very bad rap. Um, Alex and I are from Philadelphia. We lived out in San Francisco as well. Two cities that are very well known for their independent boutiques and their business owners. Orlando gets a very bad rap for being you know, a chain, you know, chain city and stuff like that. But I can't tell you enough how blown away I am with how many people in the community support local small businesses. And I think uh, it's an unfair rap that Orlando has got, but the, the food truck scene is not driven by the trucks, it's driven by the customers that come out and wait in these lines in 90 degree weather, 40 degree weather of rain, hurricanes. Um, they spend, you know, they don't, it's not cheap to come out to these events. Uh, the food is high quality, but it's also, 
you know, higher priced. Um, the scene is driven by the customers and the social media part of it, which is a huge part of our business, drives the truck as well. Um, you know, it, it's, you want people to be talking about you. You want to create a product that is unique and exceptional and different. Um, you know, a year ago, there was no cupcake trucks. There were cupcakes, but there's no cupcake trucks. So a year from now, if you're starting a cupcake truck, you have to rethink what's going to make me different from this person. Um, same thing with anybody here. You know, you want to make sure you're creating a, an exceptional product that the, the public, these people that come and support the scene, are going to say, it's worth it for me to stand in line. It's worth it for me to find these guys on Facebook and, you know, if their tires flat and they, you know, they're not open, you know, people don't get frustrated um, if you're there being a good business owner. And Orlando has a really great audience for this. And I think we're lucky to be in a city that embraces, you know, a really budding industry like this. I mean, it's, it's really a huge part of it. It seems like it's grown really fast, too. I mean, like in March of last year, I feel like we had like maybe eight, around eight sort of gourmet-ish food trucks, and now it's like 60 or 70. Well, and there's a big, I think <clears throat> there's a big difference um, between how to start a food truck and how to start a gourmet food truck. And that's not meant to sound elevated or snotty or anything like that, but there is a big difference between, you know, the price you can put on food, the type of events you can participate in. Um, and that's not decided by anybody but the public. Uh, the public will decide if you're a gourmet food truck or not. Um, food trucks have been in Orlando. You've been talking about them for years. I mean, just you know, down on OBT and stuff like that. Um, they've been in the country for years, decades. But the gourmet food truck is something new here, and it's it's, it's definitely a very you know thick line I think between the two, and uh, they're two different business models. A, a food truck does not rely on social media. It does not rely on you know young college kids. It does not rely on food truck events. A gourmet food truck does. So they're two different things, and I think when you guys are writing your business plans and you're going to get loans and you're designing your truck, you need to think, am I starting a gourmet food truck or am I starting a food truck? And, and you should treat it like like a business. I mean, it is a business. You know, you should treat it like you're opening a restaurant. Even though you're not spending $200,000, you should treat it like you're spending $200,000. Because in the end, and you'll continue yeah. to invest. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. On your generator, or your refrigerator, or your fryer. Or your engine. <laughs> you, you mentioned the, the look of a food truck. Why do some food trucks look one way, and other food trucks look better or worse? Who, like, can you talk about how the design of a food truck, a gourmet food truck, begins? I, I think, I, I, speaking for us, on my end, design played a huge role. We were lucky to work with um, some really great designers, at least on the exterior look. We bought a truck that had already previously been a food truck, but it was more of the ethnic trucks that would be in some of the more ethnic communities in town, and were kind of the open from 10 a.m. until 2 a.m. kind of family-run small operations, and we knew, we knew immediately we wanted to be more mobile, and it was about what are we going to look like when we're driving, how is this going to function for us, and so we made very few changes to the interior and put a new paint job. Um, we know trucks who put wraps on and stuff, but for us, it um, it's... We, we have a, a very clear, clearly defined aesthetic within our brand, right down to the, the type of fonts that we chose. We, you know, we didn't want to have a, uh, a script font. We wanted to have a, call, a slab font. And I mean, it was, I mean, the designers talking to me about, the, I went to culinary school for four years. I don't know about fonts and you know, Adobe and parameters and, you know, and some of that stuff. Um, but we were smart enough to learn that design was, has, been, has been and continues to be very important for our business. And it's something that we continue to invest in. Um, on the equipment side and the design of our, of our food truck, it, it's, been a ma it's been a little bit of a nightmare because we went into a, a, a space that was already designed. Whereas I'm, I don't know if which of these guys have built from scratch. It's a little bit more customizable. Snap on tool truck. And, and there are certainly more challenges with that. That has its own set of challenges, but it, it has yeah. been a challenge for us to fit what we want to do and work around our equipment because coming from a fine dining background, I'd love to design my own kitchen. And we kind of got stuck with, well, the stove is here and the fryer's here and the grill's here and the fridge is there and make it happen. And, and you know, you're working on 24 foot long food truck and it's like, all right, here you go. And sometimes you park on a hill and sometimes you're up like this and, you know, and so, um, but, but, but as far as exterior design, you know, it's important for our brand, but also for our food truck because people look at it and they, it's a first impression type thing too. First impressions absolutely is just like a job interview. You know, the first impression is all you is all you have to make that split decision whether you're going to go to this food truck or that food truck, and from there, you know, that's where your I won't even say your lines form, but that's where the, the bulk of your business starts is from. You know, we're going to try it because it's the nicest looking truck, and whether you can back it up with your food afterwards, 
that, that's up to you, you know, but make the outside look mm -hmm. appealing, look clean, so people will actually start, so, so you have that fighting chance right out of the gate. It, like Tony was saying, some were made as food trucks, his was, mine was a 1989 snap-on tool truck. Mine's 35 feet long from front to back, you know, so it's, I have more kitchen than, than some restaurants do in, in ours, it, it's huge. Uh, but that at the same time has its, its own drawbacks. You know, you have a lot of space, you need to fill that space, and if you're parked uphill, if you're parked on the side, your fryers don't work all that well, you know, and that's just things you gotta figure out as, you, as you're going along. I'd like to, you uh, yeah, Just to mirror what, what Alex was saying, it's very important to understand when you're building and, and looking at the outside of your product that it is a rolling billboard. Mm -hmm. And it, that, that idea was so important to me that I actually built a billboard into my wrap. So um, also with the, the interior, we were one of those that built from the ground up. I actually chose to go trailer as opposed to, to truck. Um, and there's definitely positives and negatives to that end. One being that you know, if my engine and my truck breaks down, I go to U-Haul and I get a truck and I'm still on the road that day. Some of these guys have to deal with, if their truck breaks down, that's it. Out that's six it. days with a blown head gasket and a cracked head. So, right. yeah. so it's, it's important to take that into consideration as well. Not that I would say go with one or the other, make that decision for your business, what's important. But um, it was definitely important to me to be able to build from the ground up and choose where my equipment was exactly and how that layout was and then to be able to to make the image of the truck and trailer look exactly the way I wanted to to you know get the customer base that I was looking for at the mechanic right now <laughs> um, I, uh, did someone, yeah, yeah I'd like to echo uh, what my colleagues have already said I too built from the ground up it was a custom design uh, trailer and my unit is uh, eight and a half by 30 feet, completely custom designed by myself. I have a full kitchen, um, then not many people know this, but I also have a full bathroom in it because I like to have convenience. Good so, to know. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're at the bazaar and you got lines that are 20, 30 deep, you don't want to run around trying to find the nearest porta potty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We all know where to go. <laughs> Sorry about that. I shouldn't have asked. Bring some fries. Go use the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, but it's secretly hidden. It's well designed, so nobody knows it's there. But um, that was very important to me. That as we're working, I didn't want my crew scrambling around, running, trying to find a porta potty if they needed to, you know, take care of business. And um, the custom design and the appearance was very important. I wanted to go with something that was uh, elegant and clean and I have so many people that come and they actually look inside your unit and they'll talk about the cleanliness of it and how sterile things look. So I went with the um, aluminum panel interior so it looks just like a kitchen throughout with the stainless and everything that's included in it. So I think your brand and how you present yourself is very important and that was important to me as I went and through the design process with my builder. Our truck uh, basically is, was built in 2003 with a second owner. Uh, we purchased it up in Michigan. We looked around the country to find a truck, and we fell upon this one by chance. A friend of mine came to me and said, offer cash in this thing, and we got a really good deal on this, and there's deals out there that you can find. Make sure you look for the particular interior that you want, or somewhat, then you can put your own equipment in there. We only had to make a couple modifications on our truck, and I'm very happy with it because it can run very quick. We've done catering jobs out of there for 350 people, produced them out. Uh, the kitchen is very streamlined. As with, with problems, we have a problem right now with our generator. I have a propane problem, uh, and you're dragging around a generator, and we have to find a truck to haul it because this thing's 15,000 pounds. Uh, so we have to find another truck to haul this thing around town, and parking with the thing's a little bit difficult. Uh, we were at an event last week and had to back it in probably about an eighth of a mile because the thing's so darn big. Uh, but we really enjoy it and this thing is really set up nicely. And if you find a good operation and the equipment that we have, make sure you get really good equipment. Just don't buy some of the stand of the road equipment. You can go out there and find used equipment at a lot of these equipment places. Uh, be careful of your refrigeration. If you find warranties and things like that, uh, to make sure they stand behind the warranties because refrigeration is expensive to repair uh, besides motors and gaskets and things like that. And I've seen other trucks having the same problems around town. Um, oh. And then, you know, just basically just find the truck that you want and what equipment fits your need and then go from there in your business plan. And you're going to spend probably about 
ten to twenty thousand dollars on equipment alone. So just have that in mind. Uh, Joey, you said uh, that sort of the, 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 the customers, Orlando, the locals built the, the gourmet food truck industry here in Orlando. What does Orlando like and what does Orlando not like? What would like for them, what, what, do, what do people want to eat and what do they not want to eat based on your direct experience? Sure. Um, that's, that's a pretty loaded question. Cupcakes. But they they want to eat yummy cupcakes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they, I, I've kind of said it before. They want to eat something. They want to come to you because you have something that's different. Um, and not different than the fast food chain, but different than anywhere else they can get something. Um, and, you know, we're in this point now that you're seeing a lot of duplications and triplications of concepts because people say, and forgive me if any of you are in this room, people say, oh, I can do that. I have the money to, I got a truck. It's not just getting a truck and you can do that. It's, it's about a brand. People in Orlando, um, the reason that they're flocking to food trucks, the food, of course, is excellent. I mean, where else can you get the food that you get from these trucks in Orlando? That's a huge part of it. But I think in addition is that, you know, um, these people are, these business owners are giving the people of Orlando something that they really cannot find anywhere else. It's something that is very different. Um, there's something that the city has not seen in a long time, um, you know, and they're also looking for some fun stuff, something that they can say, that's an Orlando thing. I mean, the Yum Yum Cupcake Truck, although a lot of the stuff was not intentional that we did in the beginning, like our bow ties and the French poodle that we have in the window, the paint by numbers that we have in the truck, it all has become something that when I have, I get emails daily, people sending me uh, bow ties that they found on eBay that they thought we would like. It's, it's become something that has become part of the truck and our identity and our brand. And I think people in Orlando want to, um, like any city, want to have something that, that is theirs. You know, the Yum Yum Cupcake Truck is, I'm just saying that because it's my truck, but I'll, any of these guys, you know, that's an Orlando thing. We have that. You know, Tampa doesn't have that. You know, we had that. So I think they're looking for something that's different, something that they can be proud of, uh, something that's a good product. And um, most of all, I think that goes a long way with us is, is the service. Um, People, it's a hospitality town. People have a, everyone's in hospitality, or they were at one point. <laughs> uh, the expectation for service, at least on our end, is huge. And uh, we try our best to deliver on it. If you guys are opening a, a food truck and you don't have any service background, take a class in it. Go to a seminar just like this because the, the customer service end of a business, it will make, if you have a great product and a great looking truck and you show up on time and you don't have good customer service, they will not come back. It's that simple. Um, I mean, I, you know, we try our best to have 100% customer service, and we still fail because there's, just, there's certain things you can't control, and that's why you really have to focus on it as a huge part of your business. But we respond to every single, anything online, any Yelp review, anything. Bad, we, good, we personally mediocre. respond, and, um, you know, we try to make it right, make it better. Um, that doesn't and, always mean giving someone a free cupcake. Um, actually, it, it actually never means that. Yeah. Um, so don't do it. It usually, it, usually means, it usually means, okay, if something was wrong, please tell me what it was so I can fix it. And next time you come to the truck, you know, and usually people that are doing that care about us and they, oh, you know, something was raw, raw off about that frosting, you know. But I think that that speaks to something greater, though, too. I think that, you know, when you, if you were to define across every truck that's here, so, and I think you guys will agree, people of Orlando want consistency. Mm -hmm. um, I change my menu daily. I think I'm one of the only trucks I have, you know, between 10 and 12 items on my menu every day. Most trucks have five or six in general. That's not saying there aren't. Um, but, but the thing about what my truck does is we change the menu every day. You know, probably half the menu changes every day or three or four items. But, but it, didn't, it didn't start that way. And people, it took a long time for people to understand that. And once they got that that was our thing, then, then that was cool to them. They, they liked that. And they knew that they could come to Big Wheel and get something different every time. Um, but it's the same type thing. They want us to be in the same places, and they want us to know. They want to know, you know, how how can I find out where you are? You know, it's it's not just about having a consistent product or a consistent menu. It's about being places consistently. It's about consistently keeping track of your Twitter or your or updating your website or updating your Facebook or updating your your Google number that people are calling or or getting back to emails. I get probably 80 emails a day between event promoters, customers, salespeople, catering <coughs> jobs, wedding people, people who want to start food trucks. Mark sends me about 10 a day. Um, uh, with cool events coming up. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Mark. <laughs> uh, um, uh, but, but there's a lot of stuff. It takes a huge amount of work to keep this going, um, to keep a consistent product. And in the back of my mind, 
that's what I'm shooting for every day is my customer service is consistent, um, my cooks are consistent, my food is consistent, my, you know, the, the event promoter that I work with is consistent, uh, you know, um, and the people that we tend to run with and work with are consistent because that's what people expect from our brand. Um, and that's what we found that people have responded to the best and the most. What does Orlando like to eat and what do they not like to eat? What have you tried that is completely bombed, and what have you tried that has been like, oh my gosh, I didn't know okay. this would sell? Okay, our, our menu is based solely on our Facebook and Twitter uh, feedback and voting each month. Um, we don't choose flavors. Uh, our customers choose our flavors. They tell us, you know, we put out one question, Joe posts one question, what do you want to see? We get hundreds of suggestions of all different types of cupcakes. It's, it's like living cupcake wars. You know, and then you just have to create, you know, you put up voting, wh whichever one is voted on to the truck, we create the best possible, most unique cupcake we possibly can um, and throw that on the truck. But there are some flavors that have never left since we started because we, we saw that the, the um, demand for that specific flavor from our customers was so great, it's a permanent item. I think, I think the question of what does Orlando like is very broad in general because Tony, does really, you know, out there things, and and but some trucks do very like, you know, uh, you know, just real simple street food. And I think everyone has a line because everyone has different tastes. So you really can't, you can't put it in terms of oh, people like a cheeseburger. Mm -hmm. People love burgers. Burgers are very popular. If you're starting a food truck, I would not suggest you do a burger truck because there's plenty out there. And how many times can you do redo a burger? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I think the the more you know, people like consistency. People like a good product. I, I think these are things you have to think about. Um, the food, you know, I mean, I find, if we're going to talk specifically food, that the more, the more kind of down-home basic the flavor, that's the ones that survive the longest on our truck. Whenever we try to do stuff that's really out there, it doesn't get eaten. I don't know, maybe if we were in Los Angeles, but I hate to say that because it makes it sound like Orlando is not capable. I just think people, when they, people eating a cupcake, they want something that's good and classic. You know, something that doesn't taste, you know, like eel or something. You know, they want, <laughs> yeah. I think they want cookies and cream. I think we've been pretty successful, but it wasn't always that way. When we started, I had the hardest time selling foie gras, and I thought, foie gras, who's foie gras off a food truck? Amazing, it's gonna be so great. And it and it didn't. Everybody was like, huh? Ah, no. Uh, you know, we did a thirteen dollars charcuterie platter our first week, and it was like twelve different types of homemade salami and pate and terrine and um, you know, very French, high end, and it, people were like. You got a hot dog, and it was like, oh, you know, when we first, when we first launched, it, it became a joke. You're like, oh, let me get the hot dog. We, what we find is we have different menus everywhere we go based upon how the crowd reacts. On Monday nights when we're in Audubon Park, I can do anything, and people will buy it. It's our best menu of the week. Monday nights, Audubon Park Farmer's Market. It's gourmet. Last night I had on local grass-fed beef shank Osabuco. People jammed it. You know, I had foie gras parfaits, stuffed deviled eggs last night. People jammed it. But then if I go to a Koei, or if I go to a Vito, or if I go to Kissimmee, you know, uh, instead of running North African fries with Ras Al Hanou and Harissa Mayo, I'm running bacon fries. And they're great, and they're a great product, but, but those are lessons we've learned, too. You have to know your customer, um, though. I mean, they're yeah. downtown, yeah. you know, Audubon Park people versus yeah. families it, in Oviedo. It's, it's, all, it's all about where you are. Um, one thing we've done that never has really taken off is the roasted bone marrow, local bone marrow with grilled artisan bread and parsley salad, and it's mm. amazing. And Good. please come buy it off my food truck, because we will run it no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and here's my take on it. When people come out to, to the food truck shows, you're out there to have a good time. You're out there with the family, with your friends. People aren't really looking, and this is my take again, people aren't looking for healthy. I mean, people are looking to enjoy what they're having, whether it's bone marrow, whether it's... I mean, it, it hasn't been yet, so yeah, hopefully yeah, soon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, people, I, I don't think people are looking for, for healthy. For healthy, you can have that at home. You can have, you want to serve something that you're not going to find at home. For us, I think it's very simple. It's in the name. They're looking for soul food, and they want authentic, good food when they come to our truck, and that's what we try to provide to them. One of our hottest sellers is our fried chicken. It is an original mm. recipe. <laughs> and we get... <laughs> and I... And we have, uh, we've learned that we must always have the fried chicken on the menu. So it's a work in progress. We learn to mm. 
between mm. things <laughs> each week, and uh, we do a lot of testing uh, to see what we're going to add to try to add something new and different that people will like. We tried fried green tomatoes at the last bazaar, and within 30 minutes, they were done. I mean, we put out samples, and people loved it, and it went out the window like hotcakes. So uh, we're trying to introduce something new, but that's authentic, not the typical greasy soul food, not healthy either, but cooked in a way <laughs> that people enjoy it and it's really, really good and authentic. And with us, it was pastrami. Um, we've had so many requests for pastrami. When we first started out the truck, we had started with one menu. A couple weeks later, after customer feedback, we changed the menu. A couple weeks after that, we changed the menu completely again. Uh, some of the product that we were working with in the beginning, people said the quality needed to be improved, so we improved the quality. And again, it boiled back down to I get more requests for pastrami on that truck than I get anything else. And besides the straight line menu, I designed a menu that was low saturated fats in a sense of people uh, with the different cuts and people, like I said, they didn't want healthy, so we had to up, right, up the little fat content in the burgers, make them a little bit moisture in what we were doing. We put an au jus over the top of them now, which is mainly grease and, and sock. But, you know, people like that, and so you give them what they want. Um, but don't be afraid to flex your menu. Start with a basic menu and then start making changes on there because if you don't make those changes, you're going to be out of business within three months. And I think that's what the public likes because, I mean, how many times do you eat out during a week? A lot of people eat out nowadays because sometimes it's just cheaper to eat out than it is to make the food at home. So you eat out. And, you know, most of these chain restaurants, they only uh, change their menu once a year. So, I mean, how many times can you have that same meal over and over for the whole year until they change it again? We're diversified. Our menu changes and, you know, it's good quality. And I think that's what the public is looking for. In general, there's a, I think there's a national movement towards comfort food, and I feel like Orlando's kind of hit on that, but comfort food revisited and rethought in a certain way. So it's something that's familiar to people, but it's got a different twist on it. Like a product that I cannot keep in-house and keep up with is the mac and cheese pop. I'll take it. It's just mac and cheese. It's skewered on a popsicle. You know, it's on a fork so you can eat it like a popsicle. And I cannot keep that product in-house. Everybody's like mac and cheese, mac and cheese. And I think there's a variety of trucks up here that have done mac and cheese and do it differently, and everybody has a different take on it. But, again, it's a comfort food item that we've rethought and revisited and, and made it a little bit different, a little bit special. And it's just something that just flies out of the shell. But I think the comfort, I think that's a good point. Even cupcakes are comfort food. But I think with that tell all of you is when you're designing your menu and you know even if you already have a menu look at your competition and look at the other trucks because if you're going to do a comfort food menu you, you don't necessarily want to go up against you know you can't I mean you, there's no rule that you, but if he you know he's thing is the, the fried mac and cheese pops you know to duplicate that um, it's just making it harder for yourself I mean can you do a better one maybe maybe not but I think it's important to really think about you know being different um, creating something comfort food but something no one else is doing you know and that the following way, but pardon and the following people follow yeah. certain trucks for certain items right and, you don't, and then will they give you the the chance to try yours you know, you're, if your trucks not ready to roll two weeks from now then you're a year and a half behind and you know a couple thousand Twitter followers and everything else I mean so he slings out Cuban sandwiches out of his window, like newspapers in the morning. I mean, it's really, and they're delicious, and they're amazing. So if you're going to do a Cuban thing, you know, think, rethink it, because, you know, if you're all trying to buy for the same 10 events in a week, you know, um, someone's going to already be there. It's, um, like, it's like me. I'm Cuban, and I can make a Cuban sandwich, but I don't, because I know he makes them. So I don't make them. Right, and you have your staples that, you know, that yeah. you're known for, and I think that's that's why you're successful is because you thought about your menu. I think everyone at this table and most of the trucks really do a good job of doing something different. And people can come and they like to try at these bazaars. People like to try, you know, a pop from you and a, and a, and a skewer from you and a cupcake from us. And you know, there's the batter bowl truck and they do dessert. And you know, people like to get a push pop from them. And you know, it's everything um, works together. And people like to sample. So the variety that, is good. Yeah, I think that speaks to it about Mark's question, kind of bringing us up speed on Mark's current question about are we all nice? And I. Uh, admittedly, I, I get the rap as being the guy who's kind of a jerk. Um, and it, your branding. It, it, it is. It, yeah. it's a big deal. Uh, uh, yeah. but, but we all we all respect each other's kind of creative license. You know, uh, when I'm at an event with Joey, I I, and I, we don't serve cupcakes in general, but but uh, you know, we, we we started when we first launched. We were gonna do cupcakes, and within the first couple weeks, we connected with these guys, and we're like, all right, we're not gonna do cupcakes. You know, I would never do a Cuban sandwich. Uh, I love Cuban sandwiches. I'm not Cuban. Uh, 
you know, I've, uh, it's the farthest thing from what I would do. Um, we've had people like, oh, you guys should do a Cuban. And it's like, you know what, there's a guy doing a great yeah, Cuban yeah. already, and, and, I, and I don't, uh, there are five macaroni and cheeses up there, some, you know, gastrotrina, known for a mac and cheese, or known for their mac and cheese. When I'm with those people, I respect their creative license to not do that so much, you know? And and as long as that's reciprocated, you know, it, it I don't have a problem with anybody coming into the business and doing all that stuff. It. What I get a lot of is, hi, this is my first day at the Food Truck Bazaar, and I'm trying to set up, and it's like, hi, I'm working, <laughs> like, you know, like, it's nice to meet you, and welcome, and, and so, I mean, the reality is, is that I'm pulling 100 hours a week working, you know, and, and I'm not exaggerating to anybody out there. I work about 100 hours a week. Oh, easy. Um, easy. At, at least. You're so, awake, you're working. So, so if, you know, it, it, it's not that I'm not a nice guy. I am. I want this food truck business to, to move forward. Um, reality is we've had a dozen trucks come and go, and they were people that came in, and they thought they were going to do it their way, and they stepped on my toes, and they stepped on Yum Yum's toes, and they stepped on Treehouse's toes, and, and we all kind of went, hey, like, what are you, like, what are you doing? Like, what's this, like, you know, and they felt like, oh, well, well, screw you guys, you know what I mean? And then they were gone. And so we've seen that a couple times. And so at least on that end, I'm a little bit hesitant to be like, hey, buddy, how's it going? And, you know, before I see what's going on, um, you know, it, it, and it's not about the fragility of our business. It's my own personal struggle, uh, you know, a lot of times. But, well, but we're, we're very welcoming. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are. On the contrast, we're very welcoming yeah. and nice. But I, I would say I think that everyone probably agree here that we all do better uh, working together. It's true. Yeah. Yes. And we identified that from the very beginning. Yeah. The you know, course. from the very get. Like, let's do things, even if it's just two trucks working together, doing a lunch. We do better when we're together. We can pull from each other's followings. So when you when you are creating your menu, creating your identity. It is very important to consider what's already out there because in the end, you want to be unique, you want to be you know different, and you want to be able to work with others. Uh, where where is a source of information in Orlando or online where they can? Is there a t how to open a food truck list? Buy a truck. Yeah. Number one. There is no <laughs> list out there. Yeah. There isn't, right? No, that's that's my no. point. There is no like online resource like for that. About it. Because it was difficult going through the process of all the licensing fees, who you got to deal with. Uh, after, so after can we just little, so can we bombs that come at you after you get it open from different municipalities and things like that, and who to work with, and you got to go in and there, and you've got to basically politic with these people a lot of times, and you've got to follow rules, or else they're going to nail you with fines. And always so, remember, there's a difference between city and unincorporated city. Right, right. <laughs> And sometimes we get spot inspections when we're out on uh, food truck bazaars. Fire, food. You got a line of people out the door, and they're there inspecting you. Health right. inspector. Yeah. No. And food truck bazaar trucks always pass. Yep. Yes, they do. <laughs> I'm not lying. Um, so why don't we get to it real quick? So how how do you start a food truck? What is what is the first step? Step one, just the basics. We actually, Alex and I, we took a bunch of courses, much like you guys are now, about small business ownership. Because like Alex said earlier, it's about owning a business um, more than owning a food truck. You have to decide if you're going to be a food truck owner, if you're going to be a business owner. They're two different things, just like owning a gourmet truck and a food truck. But um, I, you know, you, you have to run your business like it's a business. You, know, or you, you have to incorporate. You have to um, get insurance. You have to be permitted and insured. If, if you go about it like a backwards way, you will go out of business. Um, you have to pay taxes. Pay, you taxes. have to pay your taxes. They will find you. <laughs> you know, you have to be. You have to be always on the up and up with your kitchen because, like, Traveling Gourmet said, you will get spot inspections. Um, but the first thing you do, the first thing we did, is exactly what you guys are doing, and that's we were in the the Disney Entrepreneur Center, which is right around Lake Eola. We sat in a few of those classes. We talked to counselors. Unfortunately, there were no cupcake trucks in town for me to talk to, but we relied on our common sense and um, and just kind of our intuition, and we took these classes. And I think that's the first step. And it, and you'll you'll decide whether or not it's for you by just talking to people. You know, feel free to email me. I have plenty of cards. I will answer as many questions as I can in a day. Um, you know, I didn't have that luxury when I started the business, but you know. Just talk with friends about it. Bounce ideas off of people. Try out your food on your friends and family um, before you buy a truck. Do all of this before you buy a truck. Just email a few people in the county, the code enforcement. They will get, Orlando is so incredibly friendly and easy. I walked into City Hall and I had all my questions answered for me. There's nice old ladies that are ready to answer for them. I mean, it's really incredible. Coming from Philadelphia, where... Experienced. 
I'm sorry, yeah, not old ladies, experienced ladies, but, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds worse. Yeah. <laughs> what office were you in? I know an experienced lady when I see one. No, but coming, coming from up north where the cities, there's much more red tape than there are down here, we're very lucky. You can literally walk into these places and ask questions and get emails back from code enforcement and health inspectors. They're all very friendly. They're actually all, I've only come across friendly and helpful people, and I mean that. So. I think the first step before you buy a truck is to do your homework. Just send questions out. Hey, I'm starting a food truck. Can you tell me who I should talk to about license and permits? And they will point you in the right direction. It might take a while. Yeah, yeah a long while. And you might have to go through email after email. But I, I did it through just asking questions to people who are in charge. And I got the answers. This is not definitely an overnight process. By no means is this an overnight process, uh, especially if you, if you buy your truck completely ready and done. That's one thing. If you want to save some money and do it in another direction and do it yourself, it's not an overnight process. DBPR is your pretty much your number one stop. There's actual uh, page on there that tells you mobile food truck. Mm -hmm. This is what you need. It's the division of profe uh, business professionals regulation, right? right. DBPR, that's right? And that's the, that's the state yeah. of Florida. I think it's uh, sunbiz.org or um, all of those sites. So that's your first stop. Um, I know since I had a license transfer, um, we had a 30-day wait, minimum 30-day wait. Um, I know, I believe, I was told if you build from ground up, it's a 60-day wait. Um, with a transfer, if you're buying a cart or a truck that's <coughs> transferable, you don't have to do a site, you don't have to do a drawing of your truck or anything like that. Right. That's already on file, and that will be transferred to you, and you just have, it's, it, you are literally a rolling mobile kitchen. We go through the same inspection that any restaurant goes through. Um, Food's got to be below 40 or above 140. Um, you have to have running sinks. You have to have a separate hand sink. You have to Hot have water. that stuff labeled. You have to have water over 140 that can run while you're washing hands. I have 15 gallons of fresh water in my truck, and there's nothing like when the health inspector steps on in the middle of a shift, and they put they go to wash hands. They turn the water on, and they're talking to you, and they're washing their hands. The water's running, and they're washing their hands. And how's it going? Guys, been busy. That's good. Uh, and they're, you know, they're like, oh, yeah. you're not performing surgery here, and I kind of like, hey, shut that water off in between. And I go, oh, it's got to run. You know. So, um, but, but you gotta have fresh water. Um, so that DBPR is the first stop. Yeah, and it, and when you deal with the state, you gotta stay on them. You right. gotta call them. You yes. gotta call them and yep. call them because if you make one mistake on your diagram, they won't call you and tell you. No. Nope. You gotta resubmit it and pay money again. And it's all different timing too. With the state, state licenses reset April first. So like I got my license March first, and so I had to pay for a full year license, but I had to get open. I couldn't wait for another month. I, to what to open, so I paid the five hundred dollar or the three hundred fifty dollars, whatever the state fee was, so that I could be open March first. Then April first, I had to renew. So you need the state license, which is DVPR. You need your county license, which in most cases would be Orange County or whatever county you're going to operate in. Right. And then you need your city license for each individual city. Um, and every city and every county is a little bit different. The city of Orlando, if you have a city of Orlando permit, it for the most part allows you to operate anywhere within city limits. And same thing with Orange County, um, except for as long as you have that city municipality. What we've recently been running into is the city of Winter Park, where they, uh, your license in the city of Winter Park, from our understanding, um, at least from my understanding, which I do not have, we operate very rarely in Winter Park because of the difficulty in the licensure. You must have a separate license for each spot you plan on parking. Mm -hmm. And you must have a yeah. letter from each owner, and you must have a parking diagram from each owner, and you're not allowed to take any of their existing parking spaces, and you must have an allotment from the street. You've got to have that all drawn. And so for us, it's like... Well, on a curveball with Winter Park is, and how do you know this? Right. But it's also, winter, half of Winter Park is un unincorporated Seminole County, which right. is not considered Winter Park proper. And they have different rules and different laws. Right. It's a process. Know the process before Volusia you- Volusia County is the same exact way. It's, if I want to be on this side of the street in the morning, be on that side of the street in the afternoon, that's two different licenses, two different license fees, two different applications, Two different everything. I think um, I think the lesson here, and I, I think everybody would probably agree with me. It's really important to go through this whole learning process by yourself, though, because <laughs> before you launch your truck, before you buy it, because if you're still gung ho about your idea, your concept, and you're still that passionate about what you're trying to do right now, after you go through all of that, then you're probably ready to open your business yeah. at that point. But if you're not going to go through and do all that research, it's if you just it's like not for me. I don't want to read 18 pages of of regulations, of regulations yeah. and laws and you know identify my spot. You know if that's too much work or too daunting for you, then it's probably not a good idea to open your own business. I mean, nuts and bolts of it is you also have to have an ANSEL system. You know yeah. um, that's something that 
uh, the state will license you without one, but the first time you show up to an event and the fire inspector steps on and you don't have it, you're shut down. So, shut down, go home. Um, it, it's an ANSEL system, it's but a fire suppression system. Fire suppression system. system. So, but it, it, we were inspected, again, as one of the, mm -hmm. one of the higher profile trucks being the first in Orlando. The day we opened, we had helicopters flying downtown taking videos, we had two camera crews, it was great. We had 15 inspections in our first 12 days. <laughs> Between code enforcement four times, fire department four times, police who like to hang out at the pizza shop across how many citations night, did you have? Uh, we didn't have any. Oh, good. But that was the thing, is that we went through the licensure process, and I knew, <laughs> and I was on the truck every time. That's the other thing. Uh, you got to work the truck, you know. So when they, when they do step on and they say, where's your licensure? What's this? What's this? What's this? If you're somewhere else getting your cousins working it because you're tired after working your fifth day in a row, well, then you're kind of throwing, throwing someone out there, you know. So, but it, but you got to have an ant system. You got to have class K fire extinguishers, and it, it's about everything. You and know, it gets inspected every six months. Every you, six you, months. Mandatory yeah. offsite inspection every six months. They can do it in the field uh, uh, at most twice in 90 days, unless you have a citation. Then they can inspect you up to five times in those 90 days. If you have a critical violation um, or multiple critical violations, they can inspect you unlimited amount of times within those 90 days. Um, and keeping a refrigerator below 40 degrees when it's 110 outside is not always the easiest thing. So um, it's one of those things, Joe. You know, it, it, it depends on what equipment you have. The specifics of your truck will determine the specifics of your answer system and your hood system and all that. You have to have the fire. You have to have a fire company come out and recharge your fire extinguishers once a year, and then do an inspection of your hood system twice a year. And that stuff's not free. They're not like, oh yeah, we'd yeah. love to do that. That'd be great. You know, it's, yeah. it's one, la one last point about the uh, the first process is we actually our Department of Agriculture, right. and that's um, I I don't know who here is thinking about doing food like these guys, but um, we don't have, what is it, the DVPR? DVPR I don't even know what it's DVPR. called. Um, so <laughs> we, nice. we go through a different department, and that's something that you kind of have to figure out, you know. It's um, all based on your commissary. Right. You have and to belong to a commissary. commissary. Well, we, actually, we actually go out of our, uh, we have our own bakery, commercial bakery, so I pay a permit. I don't go through a commissary. We have a, a permitted commercial purchase. bakery, but yeah, they have commissaries or something. Can we there. talk about commissaries? <laughs> your commissary because I had a call. I had a call. Yeah. I had a truck call me and ask me about commissaries, and that's all I'll say. So, t so talk. Can we talk about commissaries? Yeah, you should use a commissary. It's not your house. <laughs> it's a commercial entity, a commercial business that's licensed to store, cook, prepare food. It's just like a restaurant without the seating. Pretty much. That, that, that's the easiest explanation of it. Yes. yes. Absolutely yes. mandatory. You you can either belong to one or I have my own. So I, I we, we, have, we have our yes. own kitchen. So you, if you have a commercial kitchen space that you rent, that's a different. That's correct. Product. That's different. Okay, that's, we, well, we that has to be licensed, or it's a separate thing from Orange County. But right. You have to be a preferred commissary. Right. Yeah. Right. And that and you you you're supposed to pick up your fresh water there. You're supposed to dump your gray water there. Um, but every commissary is different. Um, some are set up just for hot dog carts, and that's all they have. They have water and gray water. In hot dog carts in Orlando, you have to have a pre-cooked product. Um, that's the difference between like a hot dog cart and a food truck. In food trucks you can cook. Hot dog cart has to be 100% cooked product going on the truck. So hot dog cart commissaries are much more minimal than like a food truck commissary. They're expensive. You pay per some. I've I've rented some that were all inclusive for the month, and you got to set them on hours. Some you pay per piece of equipment per hour yep. on top of your commissary, um, uh, and then you and, and that's all besides your commissary fee for the year, which they literally just hand you a piece of paper that says you're with their commissary, so you can get inspected. So it becomes depending on what you're doing, and that should come into play with your prep time and your menus and what it is that you're doing, um, because if you're working out of a commissary that charges per hour for a piece of equipment. It adds up quick. 20, 20 hours, I, I, you know, we do 20 hours of prep. Uh, there's a, another couple of commissaries that 20 hours is included in your monthly fee. I work 20 hours of prep in two days. So, um, yep. the other thing that you have to have is uh, your food handling certificate. Uh, yes. And yes. Uh, that's something I think is renewed every, what, five years? Every five years. Five years. And uh, that's very important because when the inspectors come around, they're going to look for it. And as the manager or the owner of the vehicle, uh, you're going to have to have one. And then you're People, if you have people working with you, they have to have them as food handlers. So. One of the biggest misconceptions is you guys have no overhead. This is like money hand over fist. That's true, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. I, absolutely. I was supposed to be driving a Ferrari by now. Yes. Uh, I, I have a Matchbox one. Uh, it's not. So get that out of your heads right now. It is not you have your, whether it's a commissary fee or whether it's where you store your truck. 
whether you have propane, gas, mechanical, uh, refrigeration, your equipment, your uh, fire, uh, their, your licensing, there's so much money that goes into it, it's not as glamorous as people think it is. Before I you mean, buy food. Yeah. Yes. And, and that's before you buy food, yes. Bottom, bottom line is you're, you're going to pay your expense somewhere. It's maybe cheaper to open your door on day one, but uh, I never thought I'd get so excited about generators or so excited about, <laughs> you know, uh, new, new, new refrigerator gaskets, guys. And I think my, you know, my sous chef, Eric, had a little tear come to his eye, you know. I, it's, it's the little stuff that, that you don't think about. It's, um, uh, again, I know I, our pro forma looked a lot different than, than where we ended up, so. I remember when I ordered my first porta potties yeah, for the bazaar. Right. I took a picture and put it on Facebook. <laughs> it's the little things. How does the food truck bazaar work? I mean, who decides where, to, where, where you go? How often do you go? You know, Works wonderful. It's like the best thing on earth. <laughs> I mean, we have enough to deal with as it is, like our books and all, you know, and all that. So Mark organizes us to go to different places, and we pay him a fee. <laughs> Yeah, it's a curated event. Uh, I, I produce the event, and we go to different cities. And you just uh, email me. You email me a photo of your truck and your menu, and we go from there. And I choose trucks uh, based on variety, so I can't have six chicken trucks. Based on quality, um, you have to have all of your paperwork, and the owner must be nice. And I, you laugh, but like this is an intense. I mean, I'm not a truck owner, truck but I'm still there with them, like walking, picking up trash, all this. It's very, very intense. And if you are not a nice person, I won't work with you, even if your truck is amazing. What's your territory? We're, right now, we're in six cities. Uh, probably by the end of, what's the next month? May? Central Florida? April? All of Florida. New Smyrna, New Smyrna Beach. Central Florida. Right yeah, it's about an hour okay. from Orlando. East Coast to West Coast. <laughs> it's 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 really the cities. Uh, some cities contact me and ask me to bring it, or I pursue. It just depends on the opportunities that come my way and the opportunities they make myself. And there's a lot. Of it could be everywhere. Usually about once a week. Once a week. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of events, but a lot of events, most events charge. So you yourself have to set a limit on how much you want to pay for an event. Because mm -hmm. there are some events that are $2,000. i got to sell a lot of meals to make up that $2,000 for you know, a two-day event. I, Tony has a really good 10% you know, like rule. Like if you're, can you yeah, have... we, budget, we budget between uh, 5 and 6% for rent. Um, for charitable events, we'll go up to 10 to 12%, depending on what it is. And then events that, uh, and, and this has become part of our whole learning process. Um, when somebody calls us and says, hey, uh, you know, can you come out? We've got 100 people that are hungry, and we're going to invite uh, six food trucks out. You know, um, We've developed a whole matrix of, do you call me? Do I call you? What day of the week is it? Is it lunch? Is it dinner? Um, because we have very real costs associated with employees. How much am I going to have to pay my employees extra if we're going to work a double? You know, If I go to walk with my guys, like, hey, guys, you guys want to work a double next Tuesday? We're already working on Friday. You know, They'll do it if I pay them the right amount. You know, but that means they're going to charge the right amount. So it, it's, it's always different. Here, here's just a, a quick, I guess, thought on whether it's a brick and mortar or whether it's a food truck. In a brick and mortar, you want your rent to be no more than 10% of your monthly income. So if you're doing $30,000 a month, you, you want your rent to be no more than 3000 It can't be for you to actually be profitable because then you have all your other costs. Same thing with the food truck. You have to look at it the same exact way. If, you're, if the fee is... Thirty dollars, you have to do a minimum, three hundred dollars. But even that isn't even worth your time with gas, labor, and everything else. So even though it's lower, you have to think bigger. You know, it, it, it's hard. It is, and also for us, um, because we don't do it full time like a lot of uh, the panel here. Um, myself, I have another career, so it's kind of like a side investment for me. And uh, but we are starting to we're recognizing that we need to get out a little bit more and we do a lot of catering and uh, we're venturing more in that area and we're doing the food truck bazaars on the weekends but my husband is kind of like a silent partner in the deal but um, based on our work he has a career I have a career and we kind of do this as a side investment because we love it I mean I love to cook I love to interact the best thing about it for me is interaction with the people I love that you should, um, when you're planning your business, and, and the, the schedule is the, one of the most other important things that you guys are working with, 
because if you don't, you have a truck and you have all this great stuff, if you don't have a place to take it, it's pointless. So, um, but when you do your schedule and you're figuring out your calendar, the events and the bazaars, it's like Mark said, it's very intense. Plan it out like you're not going to get into any of them. And there's, the city of Maitland has a wait list that extends for six months. I mean, there's only so much room around that lake, and the city already barely wants us. You know what I mean? Like, it's, um, it's something that you have to think about and plan as if you're not going to get into any of these things. And if you do, it's a bonus. But plan your, um, your business around your own schedule. Like, kind of Alex said, going through that process of, of figuring out if this is the right thing for you. You know, figure out where you think your demographic would be and park your truck there or, or figure out how to get there. Look for locations on your own. If you get into... Um, events and pods and you network with people and you do then it's an, a bonus my business plan did not say food truck bazaar twice a week talent. Maitland food truck pod those things had to be developed and we had to work on those uh, the Maitland food truck pod is something that I worked with the city of Maitland with to create um, you know who knew the city of Maitland would be one of the first cities in, in central Florida to host a food truck night once a week um, but anyhow this, to, to keep that into consideration you should be able to spend less than $100,000 to get your business up and running food truck wise, and you should have at least six months of disposable income behind you. About $100,000. Oh, that's good to know. <laughs> I, think, I think it's going to vary based on um, what you do and what your offerings are and uh, your menu, uh, how you staff. And for me, I use free labor. I use my family, so I, I, I can't afford to pay anybody. <laughs> but the licenses are about $1,000. Yeah, but you have licenses. To, right. Alex and I started our trucks on uh, our credit cards for $15,000. So, um, you know, I, I wish I would have had a lot more. Um, it was, you know, I'm st I still have the credit cards, but, um, you know, it's, it's, but, you know, we didn't have to put in all these, you know, grills and crazy things and fryers. We didn't have to go through all these crazy departments. I mean, the, the process we chose, so it's really, you know, people who are doing simpler concepts, um, you know, it's not always 100000 but it could be a, that, you know, more than that. It depends what you're doing. Um, you know, how much are you going to invest in marketing? I invested a ton in design, branding, marketing, website. Um, you know, that was where a lot of my costs were. And, that, you know, that's, it's equally important to the fryer you're putting in your truck if you're choosing to be a gourmet food truck. That, that, that is equally important, important to the business, that part, the branding part of it. I'm sure you have a ton more questions. Uh, we have run out of time. But I, I hope that we've left you with a few thoughts. Number one, that the city of Orlando is very easy to work with. Number two, there is a great friendly, wonderful, gourmet food truck community here that you can talk to online. Please come to the bazaars and talk to them in person. But just know that there's a community here that's uh, here to help you. And uh, good luck. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.